Hello and welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. We're back with another innovator interview, and this one is one I've been excited about for uh, several months because we had to delay it once. The evolution of the recycling system is something that we think about a lot here at Earth 911. And our guests today are Shannon Bouton, who is the CEO of Delterra, and Ella Flay, the regional director for Asia at Delterra, which is a new environmental nonprofit working on rethinking recycling in emerging economies. The organization was incubated for three years by the business consulting giant McKinsey and & Company and has already diverted more than a thousand tons of waste from landfills and the oceans, as well as achieving up to 60% recycling participation rates in several locations in Indonesia and Argentina. That's well above how much recycling we do here in the United States. So we want to understand how we're making those, how Delterra is making those uh, gains. And now, despite the pandemic, Delterra's recycling and waste management services have scaled up over these last few years and currently serve more than 50,000 people with plans underway to reach a quarter million people by the end of 2022. Its programs have kept the lives and livelihoods safe for more than 450 affiliated waste workers. These are marginalized and often overlooked people who are an essential component of the solution to recycling and by providing them a safe, fair and dignified working condition, we can make real progress. You can learn more at uh, delterra.org. Delterra is spelled D-E-L-T-E-R-R-A. And of course, .org is spelled .org. Welcome to the show. How are you, Ella? How are you, uh, Shannon? Well, it's lovely to be here with you, Mitch. Thank you for having us. Good morning. It's yeah, It's wonderful to be here. Well, you, you're doing a lot of really interesting work, but I want to ask a really broad general question to begin with, and that is, in a nutshell, what's involved in rethinking recycling globally? It, it's a pretty big target. Yes, absolutely. So I think the first thing is to paint a bit of a picture for what recycling looks like uh, in other countries um, and waste management, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so about 2 billion people around the world have no access to waste management, so no uh, regular waste collection in their communities. Uh, and those are the communities, it's some of the communities that we're most focused on. Uh, and these, and so that means that we're not just rethinking recycling for them, we're rethinking the entire entirety of waste management for them uh, and trying to figure out how to build recycling in from day one. Well, and that really goes to the question of rethinking the economy too, uh, because we have simply thrown stuff away. Now we are looking to bring it back into useful production. Uh, and, and it's striking that we have two, million, two billion people with no ser uh, waste services because we've gotten water services down uh, to the last 750 million uh, humans who haven't had access to it. Why haven't we thought about waste as, as diligently as we should have for so long? Is it simply the fact that we were growing so fast and it was too much fun to think about the garbage? <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I, I don't really know the history of why that hasn't happened, but I would say that it's a very complex process. It's not an easy thing. It's not so it's not a cut and paste from one community to the next to just say we're going to put waste management with recycling and try and avoid things like landfilling or burning incineration, things like that uh, into communities. It, it takes quite a lot of uh, thinking about all of the pieces and moving parts in this process. So it isn't something that's it is easy. Um, and I think that it also requires, you know, quite a, a quite an, an amount of investment, right? A lot of infrastructure investment, and so that's probably part of the reason that it hasn't happened as fast. What's the essential difference between what we experience here in the United States and those uh, of people in the emerging economies when, with regard to the waste? Is it, is it is it concentrated in one place, or does garbage tend to spread out when it isn't managed by a, a an industrial system like we have? Um, well, so it, it, it not all countries look alike, right? So most of Latin America looks a lot like the United States, maybe with a little bit less or quite a bit less recycling infrastructure. And there, waste is generally collected in most communities. And then it's most often landfilled, right? So and that is, it, it doesn't look a huge amount different. It's just how much of the waste actually ends up in the landfill and who's paying for it. And, and if it's not, if you have to pay to dump in the landfill, sometimes the, it gets dumped outside of the landfill. Sure. But, you know, honestly, all of that happens for me in Michigan. I live out in the countryside and my neighbors are struggling with people driving down our road and dumping trash along our roads often, you know. So it's not it's not unique to, to emerging economies. 
Well, I was just going to say in Indonesia, it looks very different than that, right? There is no waste collection in most cases. And a lot of communities just choose an empty lot and dump their waste there and then burn it. Or they dump it into the local canal or they, uh, you know, or they pay an independent waste collector who they hope is taking it somewhere that they should be taking it. Um, so it, they're sort of left more to themselves, to their own devices to figure out what to do with their waste. And that's when you also start to see a lot of waste getting into the environment. Now, does that mean that you need to evangelize the idea of recycling in these emerging countries, or are people already interested in limiting the environmental damage that that re- waste represents? Ella, what is your perception in Asia? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone wants to live in a, a clean and safe environment. You know, this mm-hmm. is most people have got a, a high level of consciousness of wanting to be in a clean and safe environment. I think there are a couple of major barriers. One is about you know education education of the kinds of polymers we're using with different kinds of plastics, and also education about the the waste management system. But I think another really big part, which is what our program really focuses on, is that often communities don't have the tools to run effective waste management. So in our work in Indonesia, we have something which we call the Rethinking Recycling Academy. It is an end-to-end training program that supports communities in transforming their waste management uh, solutions into effective green, inclusive, and economic recycling systems. Um, And it's really about making sure that they have all the tools that they need to succeed, whether that be financial literacy, Mm -hmm. how to optimize their operations, how to launch behavior change campaigns, whatever it is that they really need to to build an effective recycling system. You know, we tend to think that everybody's working toward what the the rich countries have today, the infrastructure we have today, but the rich countries' infrastructure is built on a 1950s concept of a single stream waste model. Should we also be rethinking U.S. recycling and not taking our assumptions and trying to project them into the rest of the world? Yeah, I think you could say U.S. recycling is not working the way we would like it to. So there, it's it's hard to say everyone else should be replicating that because it's not a system that's functioning very well today. Um, I think we do do single stream recycling. We separate into three streams, organics, residue, and dry recyclables. Mm -hmm. And we take anything that is dry and potentially recyclable in our systems because they're very manual. Um, So we don't have big fancy machines like most of the U.S. recycling centers do. We have people. Um, And that actually gives us a huge amount of flexibility because we are able to then, uh, you know, turn on a dime and start collecting a different material because we found a market for it. Which is so really the capital helpful. expenditures that we make lock us into a model and we don't innovate as much as we might, it sounds like. No, I just think it's cost, right? So labor costs are cheaper in other countries. And so and and people want these jobs because they're good, well-paying jobs. And so mm-hmm. they come in and um and and we we don't we stay away from the technology because we have seen it get it in places be implemented and then break down and not function. Uh, and no one can fix it because there's no one around to be able to fix those machines. In the U.S., when you put a new recycling strain, strain in, right, you have to put in new technology uh, so that your MRFs can read that new material. It's not it's not an, uh, an investment. I mean, most many companies are willing to make that investment so that their material will be captured. Um, but that's the I mean, w- w- in the U.S. with this hopeful recycler system, you're still getting all that material. Right. So you just need to choose to keep it instead of throw it out. Well, you mentioned companies are interested in recapturing this material. Um, that is a growing trend, but do you actually see this happening more elsewhere in the world than it is here? Are, are brands, for instance, in Asia thinking we can introduce circularity and keep our local economy more circular uh, rather than the, the approach that we've taken in the United States, which is to avoid EPR, extended producer responsibility, as much as possible? Well, I can I can definitely speak to what I see in Indonesia. But you know, in Indonesia, we see the big corporate players making big commitments. You know, commitments like having fifty percent recycled content by twenty twenty five, even up to sort of ninety to one hundred percent by twenty thirty. What's difficult about these commitments is that they're really really hard to meet right now, particularly in somewhere like Indonesia, where where you're starting from a baseline of almost zero percent recycling and very very minimal waste. Uh, waste management infrastructure, you have to sort of build the system up from scratch. So for these players to sort of reach those volumes that they need to kind of meet their commitments, there is going to be some, there needs to be some really heavy investment in the recycling uh, system in Indonesia over the next few years. Otherwise, it just would be impossible uh, to, to meet those volumes. 
So does Delterra focus on trying to cr- increase the volumes of specific materials in order to create a critical mass? Yeah, we we focus on all materials. Um, I mean, we we are an environmental nonprofit, so our agenda is very much environmentally focused. And the damage that is caused by landfills being full of organic waste is also extremely high. So when we think about our programs, we think about, you know, how do we either compost or put organics back into another form of productive use? We look at all forms of recyclables, whether it be plastics, papers, cards, etc. And actually, in a really, really, truly effective system, there's only around 10% of the waste stream that is truly residue and non-recyclable. So if you can actually build effective systems, you would be able to reduce the amount of waste you send to landfill by 90%. So this holistic approach gives you the opportunity to really look across the entire waste stream and think about opportunities for optimization and also cross-pollinate that optimization in different types of materials. Yes, and it also helps with the economics. Because some materials are have a higher value in a marketplace than others. Sure. And so it makes it possible for us to cross-subsidize the collection of the low-value materials as well, because we're collecting those high-value materials. Oh, that's an interesting observation. I hadn't really thought about that way. I mean, generally, we tend to focus on point solutions rather than Absolutely. thinking about the whole problem. Now, you, you did a project in Buenos Aires, uh, Barrio Mujica, uh, that introduced waste recycling and, waste, and recycling pickup services. And that's not a, an easy place to do that. What did you learn from the experience? And, and tell us about it. So Barrio Mujica is a an informal settlement. It's one of the oldest informal settlements that sits in the center of Buenos Aires. So it's, it's a slum, right? And it doesn't have normal uh, social services or didn't have. Um, the, the Buenos Aires government was in the middle of working with the IDB to uh, to formalize that area. And when we arrived, they had not thought about how they were going to manage their waste, Mm-hmm. Uh, and so at the moment, uh, you know, when we arrived, it was basically being dumped either in the street or they had put some dumpsters on the outs- outskirts of the slum and people would walk out and put their waste there. Um, however, they had hired uh, um, uh, groups of waste collectors um, to go and, str- and sweep the streets. And so we basically said to them, uh, we can train the waste, the system, the people that you already have in your system to mm-hmm. actually collect waste in a separated way. Uh, and then to sort the waste and sell, and we will be able to supplement the salaries that you're already paying them with the sale of those recyclables. And so they got very excited about that, as did the community. Uh, and we started uh, tra- training uh, the waste collectors to do the program. And they are they do the whole thing themselves, right? They do the education, the door-to-door education of their neighbors. Um, they they record how much material is being collected. Uh, they track uh, the material it threw into the sorting center. And in fact, because each of the groups is in a different cooperative, they actually track how much waste they gen- put into the MRF so that they can actually receive the money for their contribution back. Um, and it's, that's all done by the waste collectors themselves now, uh, which is what what is the hallmark of a sustainable system, right? Because they're running it themselves. Well, and, and what you also bring in that situation is social capital. The, the fact that people are going to go to their neighbors and say, not only this is a good thing, but I can help you do it. And it's how I make my living, which is something we have insulated most people from here in the States. Now, uh, there's uh, a couple of profiles on your site about two brothers in Buenos Aires, Juan and Adrian, and they started picking trash in the landfills in their early teens. And now they're raising families running a recycling business, essentially. Is their story representative of the opportunity that people have to to, to essentially create new industries at, the, at what we would describe in the, in the old way of thinking, the bottom of the economy? Yeah, so I think th- uh, they are a great example of um, some of the waste workers who were very informal um, mm-hmm. and who often work in very dangerous conditions uh, and who we've been able to bring into our programs and give formal jobs with you know health and safety measures and proper access to health care. Uh, and these are things that you know, many of these waste collectors before, waste pickers, didn't have any access to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's made a huge difference for many of the people in our programs. Uh, in Indonesia, for example, many of the people who are in our programs are uh, migrant workers. Mm-hmm. And you can't register for health care if you don't have the right IDs, and most of them don't. So our programs help them to get registered for the local health care um, and uh, and they it also gives them a sense of pride and you can see it. I mean, and I invite everyone to go look on the videos that we have on our website. Uh, the waste workers are a core part of our program um, and they they develop a real sense of pride 
uh, as eco warriors in these programs, and it's wonderful to see. You know, it's interesting. I mean, we've done interviews with uh, 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 organizations that have prevented illegal logging, and what they traded in exchange for the the chainsaws that the, the illegal loggers were using was healthcare. Uh, and literally, they were cutting down trees so they could have a child or pay for somebody's medical care. And so this is that's an essential component of this entire structure. How does Delterra address the, the social challenges involved in creating this kind of work for underrepresented people? Uh, how do you help them organize and bring particularly women into safe and supported working environments? I think one of the essential pieces is, is formalizing the work, right? So, you know, when we first start working some of these communities, as Shannon mentioned, the the the, the waste pickers are completely informal. So they, they earn on a day-to-day basis. They're not protected. They don't have any rights. Just even going through that, that minor process of formalization, giving people work contracts, allowing them to access healthcare, starts to really elevate them in society. And it's definitely one of the things that we've noticed is people become very proud of their jobs because it is a real job in the eyes of the communities that they're working with. I think um, our work in the informal settlements in Buenos Aires is especially beautiful because we've actually provided a lot of jobs to women who would have really struggled to find employment elsewhere Mm -hmm. and also employment which has the flexibility to allow them to raise their families because they are not going to be individuals who can afford to put all of the children in childcare whilst they go to a whilst they go to work. So we've really tried to create flexibility here in the system. So what would a day in the life of one of those female workers look like? How, how flexible is that day? It, what you just said made me think of how we are trying to organize the gig economy in the United States too. We're not particularly good with individual contractors, even in high paying jobs. What is life like for one of these women? Sure. I mean, so if we were to take a uh, Barrio Mujica is a, a good example. You've got often your waste collectors and you've got your waste sorters. So the collectors will go yeah. through the streets, uh, normally calling out that they're collecting the recyclables, commu- like the, the local house. Bring out your will, trash? Bring out your trash, exactly. Okay. And they, We've also had a fantastic initiative where we put hooks up on the sides of the building so people can hang their recyclables out. Um, they move through the streets, they collect that waste, they take it to a local sorting center. Mm-hmm. And then that waste is then sorted through from, you know, all of your recyclables are sorted into your plastics, your cards, your metals, your different plas- uh, plastic types, your organics gets, uh, gets separated, and then the residue goes to landfill. So you know, the life, I mean, it really depends on how many hours they're working, but normally most of them are working part time every day, um, or based on the hours that they're able to work. Yeah. Now, one of the things that we tend to associate with this kind of, of dirtier work is, is a caste system. How does Delterra help evangelize the dignity of this work? Or is the worker's own self-confidence the form of evangelism that changes the community's perception of their place? I think, um, yeah, I mean, I suppose I wouldn't describe it so much as a, as a, as a caste system. but for, Well, for that's sure. the old way of thinking about it, yeah. right? Well, it's yeah. also very India focused, right? So it's different culture than well, there's no caste system in Argentina, for example. There, there is in Indonesia for sure. Uh, as yeah. it's, um, in Bali, it's a Hindu island. But I think it's, um, I mean, it's it's a little bit about what I was saying before about this idea of how do you elevate people within the communities that they work in. I think one of the things that's been a really important part of our program is educating the local communities, including all the households that we serve, about why recycling matters. And that actually our waste workers are warriors. You know, they are warriors on the kind of front line of the waste crisis. They are the people who are also trying to solve the pollution that is ending up in the oceans and and washing up on the beaches. And that this is really, this is really part of a community movement and everyone needs to be part of that. And I think one of the things that we did in our program at uh, one point is we highlighted what the work of a waste worker looks like Mm -hmm. to community members if you don't recycle, you know, siphoning through the you know, thigh high mixed waste and the lack of dignity that that job has. Um, and I think it was it was really enlightening for a lot of people to realize what happens in the waste management space and how dirty it can be if we're all not part of a, you know, a broader recycling movement. And that highlights another set of cultural differences too, um, which is a, around the messages that resonate for different communities. So this is the, the sort of key unlock is trying to figure out how do you motivate people to separate their waste in their home? because it is an extra step, it's more work, right? So how do you get them to do that? And what that's what we, we, every time we go into a community, we actually work with the community to understand what message will resonate. And as Ella said, the unlock in Indonesia 
at, at least partly, uh, was that image of if I don't sort my way, somebody else has to, will sort it for me and it will be right. a, a more disgusting job. In, in Argentina, in Barrio Mujica, the conversation is more about people don't want the waste sitting in the streets because their children are playing in it and they see them getting sick. And so they want a cleaner environment um, in their own personal community. Uh, in Oliveria, where we also work in Buenos Aires, the conversation is more around being a modern community. And there they want to have all of the, the most modern waste services because that's part of their evolution into a clean and environmentally sustainable, but mostly modern community. Is feedback important to getting the, the consumer in this situation engaged in this? And, and so do you actually communicate back, this is what's happening to your waste now? Or is it simply the fact that it's clean in the street that drives their their participation? I think you need both. Um, and so, of, of course, people need to see the kind of the environmental effects. So mm -hmm. their community is getting cleaner. Um but I think another big part and it's a very big, large part of our behavior change campaigns is that reinforcement element of like, how do we go back to these households and not only tell them about the successes, but also tell them where maybe there, are, there is room for improvement. Sure. Uh, so we sort of find that like, you know, after one or two months after launching a behavior change campaign, we need to communicate with those same households to kind of tell them how it's going and what else we can be doing. And one of the ways that we've been doing that uh, is with a digital chatbot. So we have a WhatsApp. Um, based chatbot where all the community can members can message in with questions. Like it might, I'll give you an example, but it would be like, you know, I have a dead cat. Can I recycle this? And, you know, and then we can go back and say, actually, you know, according to Indonesian law, you should bury your dead cat as opposed to try and recycle it. But it's, you know, it's, it's these kinds of examples, but we really try and kind of maintain that, uh, that feedback loop with everyone that we work with. You know, we get thousands and thousands of questions every year at Earth 911, but I've never heard the dead cat question. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually, I think it's come up more than once already. Which really? is interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, so do you also do billboards and out of home kind of advertising in order to get people to start thinking about and, and join the mission? Yeah, yeah we we've actually started to do that a lot in Olivia. So in uh, there, there are billboards and uh, bus stops and all sorts of stuff with, with, uh, with flyers on them saying, you know, you, we're uh, recycling is coming to your community. Here's the date it's going to start. Here's what it's going to look like. Here's what to expect. Um, or even just the message, please recycle, right? And uh, and be part of this movement in our community. Now, it, this is, you were funded by uh, McKinsey and they gave you $6 million to launch the nonprofit after incubating the, the organization for several years. Shannon, you were there for 15 years. Um, what's McKinsey's motivation? for doing this? Is it an opportunity to simply help or is this also a hotbed of new business development opportunity for McKinsey and the countries that it consults to? Uh, so this is part of McKinsey's corporate social responsibility agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about it from more, it was more from the perspective of rather than just giving money, maybe we can also give some of our people to this. Uh, and use some of the methodology. So for, for those of us who were part of McKinsey.org and now Delterra, this was an intellectual exercise as well in, can we take some of the thinking that we've learned to do uh, and the problem solving and apply it to the planet as our client rather than a big corporation as our client? Um, there is no real agenda. There's no agenda behind this for uh, client development uh, for McKinsey and company. Um, because it's not really an area that they work in very much. Um, and it's also, uh, you know, there isn't these community programs that we're building. The, there is not a lot of money to be made here. Right? <laughs> no, but there are essential services that hold the rest of the economy up. And I think that's a Thank really, it, it, but that's what we all need to be doing. It's not yes. that the company should be motivated by greed all the time. Uh, I, I think we're moving past that concept of the, of the firm, but, this is how we create the equitable society that continues to thrive as we resolve the climate crisis. Now, how do you continue to fund uh, Delterra.org as you move forward? Are you looking for donations from individuals? Are you primarily going to be looking for corporate uh, support? Today, we're not set up to take contributions from individuals. So we are looking for corporate support and other foundations. So we have um, a number of different funders, including companies like Amcor, um, and then and then we also work with foundations like the Alliance and Plastic Waste mm -hmm. to fund our programs. 
so how can our listeners keep up on what you're doing and learn more? Uh, what should they start with when they visit deltiara.org? Well, I always feel like our programs come to life when you watch the videos. Okay. Uh, so I think that's a great place to start to actually see what this looks like on the ground and and the people um, who are happy and, and experiencing the change in their lives. Um, and there are some lovely stories with community members uh, from, you know, what life has, how life has changed even since the 1970s with the introduction of more plastic into a lot of these communities and what that has done to them. Um, so I think that's a great place to start. And then, of course, um, you know, our website is full of all sorts of great information on case studies of where we've worked and our theory of change uh, and how we think about uh, our approach to this problem and hopefully more problems in the future too. So looking out, say, at 2030 or 2035, where do you see the state of those 2 billion people without current waste services? Are we, are we going to be halfway through, all the way through? What's, what's your goal? I think it's a very hard one when you start looking at, at, at the 2 billion number. It is such a huge uh, huge population size that, that needs to be covered in the global south. And the investment required is, uh, you know, in Indonesia alone, it's in the hundreds of millions. Um, if Once you start to look across also sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of Asia and South America, uh, you're obviously into the, into the billions. I think, you know, one of the things we're really focusing on is trying to build replicable models. Like how do we build a model that we can then start to kind of roll out and scale at scale, you know, like quickly and consistently. And I think that's really essential because there is lots of pockets of good work being done in the waste management space and the recycling space, but none of them are covering the numbers that we need to cover um, over the next 10 years. So I think, you know, one of our hopes is, you know, if we can really sort of develop these strong replicable models, how can we then partner with other organizations to really kind of roll out those programs and bring not only recycling services, but waste management services to large proportions um, of those underserved populations. Well, I hope that we can help you propagate those ideas. And I want to thank both of you for spending time with us today. Thank We really appreciate it. It's been lovely to join you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very much, Mitch. We very, very much enjoyed it. Well, that was a fascinating conversation. And I want to thank Shannon Bouton, who is the CEO of Delterra, as well as Ella Flay, the Regional Director for Asia at Delterra. Folks, uh, we do a pretty bad job of recycling here in the United States. Only about 30% of our materials are collected and recycled uh, reliably, and that may be somewhat illusory, too. There's a lot of work all around the globe that we have to undertake in order to make this a circular economy. And I hope that these ideas and the others that we share here on the show are useful to you and that you'll share them with your friends, your family, uh, coworkers. Let's get these ideas out there. With more ideas, there will be less waste. So this is Earth 911, sustainability in your ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe, your host. We are going to be back with another innovator interview soon. In the meantime, take care of yourselves, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. Have a green day. Earth 911.